Hello, this is Lila. In this video, I'm going to be discussing some more corruptions in the Bible, specifically the Old Testament. I'm going to focus on the books of the prophet. I'm going to go too specific into each book. I'm just going to kind of give an overview of a very common corruption that's found in a lot of books of the prophets. So in some of my other teachings, I have shown that the original version of the book of Deuteronomy was very different than our copies in, in all of the Bibles. What I showed is that the, the Temple Scroll is the best version of the original Deuteronomy that we have. And in this Temple Scroll, I show many examples in some of my teachings where in our copies, it's Moses speaking, referring to God, what God says in the third person, like God says this. But in the Temple Scroll copy of Deuteronomy, those same exact passages, instead, the same words, but instead of saying God said this, or God did this, or things like that, it'll say, I, me, my. He'll use first person. So we already have a very clear example of the interchange between first and third person. The fact being, if I'm right that the original version of Deuteronomy is the Temple Scroll, and I believe I've provided clear, irrefutable evidence for that position, so if I'm right about that, that means all other copies, every other single copy of the book of Deuteronomy has been radically altered and has been altered in such a way that the original first person narrative and content was altered to a third person content and narrative. And so we're going to see, I'm going to show now in this video, evidence that this phenomenon is not exclusive to the Temple School, although it is most prominent, most radical in the Temple School versus Deuteronomy. But it's not limited exclusively to the Temple School, but that this phenomenon happened in the other books of the Old Testament. So I'm going to go through that now, and I'm going to show the evidence for that. There's actually a lot of books for that position. One second here. I'm going to share the screen now. It's late here, so I'm kind of talking a little quiet, so I don't disturb anybody if they're trying to sleep. So let's see here. All right, so we start with Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Now, all these are from the Septuagint, but it's essentially <clears throat> it's the same phenomenon, whether you're viewing the Masoretic text or whether you're viewing the Septuagint. So we look in... Isaiah, first of all. So we used to do a search of Isaiah. We're gonna, we've got 20 instances, or a little less than 20 instances, about 16 instances of Isaiah. Starts off here, the vision which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. The word which came to Isaiah, the son of Amos. The Lord said to Isaiah, Isaiah, the vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. We've got one down here. And the Lord spoke to Isaiah, the son of Amos. And finally, we've got a huge section down here. A bunch of stuff, a bunch of references to Isaiah. And then all of a sudden, chapter 40 on, not a single instance. I go through that in a little bit more now. But so first we're gonna look and see it's introduced 
the word which came to Isaiah, third person. But then after the word is introduced, then it's quoting what his word is, and it quotes it in the first person of his word. So, so far that makes sense. But now we go to a, a very strange phenomenon we have right here. And it came to pass in the year in which King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne. Instead of saying Isaiah, it says I, which breaks the theme that was established in the, at the beginning, where it introduces Isaiah in the third person, and then here in chapter 6, it changes, he, he, Isaiah sings a song, and then all of a sudden he's talking about, came to pass in the year in which King Isaiah died, and he's talking about it in his own perspective. And I said, woe is me. Then you've got, they were sent to me, touch my mouth. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and I said, and he said, and I said. So you see right there, it's a first person account. Immediately following, now remember, in the original manuscripts, in the copies, there's no chapters. These chapter divisions are man-made. So we have to remember that there are no chapters and that this should be considered a continuous text. So immediately after, the chapter six directly goes into chapter seven and it says, and it came to pass in the days of Ahaz. So it's giving a little information there. It says, and the Lord said to Isaiah, go forth to meet Ahaz and thou shalt say to him. So we have a command, someone writing so that the Lord said to Isaiah, instead of the Lord said to me, they're changing it to Isaiah. And then you've got verse 10, and the Lord again spoke to me, ask for thyself a sign. And Ahaz said, now it says, and he said, Who's the he? It's either God or Isaiah. But now watch, after the sign that's given to Ahaz, there's no introduction. There's no introduction to Isaiah. And yet just Isaiah just starts talking out of nowhere. No introduction at all. And the Lord said to me, if it was consistent with what it was earlier, it would have said, the Lord said to Isaiah, but no. Even though there's no introduction of Isaiah, it says, and the Lord said to me, and the Lord spoke to me yet again. So you see what's going on here. There's a serious corruption here. Uh, it keeps going, this prophecy continues all the way to the end of chapter and then chapter 12 ends the vision which Isaiah sent of Amos saw against Babylon. This is probably an added heading that was added by the scribes and was not in the original. Because the original, you didn't need to say what the vision was about. It's a title. Titles so often are clearly added afterwards by someone. We see the scholars do that all the time. They add titles to clarify what he's talking about. That's what we see in, in Bibles. We see modern Bibles, like in any modern Bible, you're gonna see headings. I'll just give one quick example. Um, let's see here. Um, just you just go to any passage or you just go to Isaiah not in the King James but you can go to the New King James you're going to see okay look the wickedness of Judah what that's a title it's not in the actual text the degenerate city not in the actual text 
the future house of God. So you see the titles are added by the scribes, not part of the original text. So, um, it's clear that this is what's going on here. So this was added. The original was just Isaiah talking, uh, giving a, a prophecy. Now, let's see here. Let's try to find another one. Okay, so we got... Oh yeah, well, hold on. But yeah, so anyways, that's, that's a clear example of changes. So for some reason, just at chapter 20, it goes back to third person. Then the Lord spoke to Isaiah. Now we go way down here. We've got some interesting things here. It says, Elus of the priest clothed with sackcloth uh, were sent to Isaiah the Amos the prophet. Um, first, we already had this at the beginning, Isaiah the son of Amos, so why does it have to repeat again, son of Amos? Why does it have to keep saying that? It could just say Isaiah doesn't have to keep saying the son of Amos. See, it says Isaiah. It doesn't. The word which came to Isaiah, the son of Amos. But down here, it's. And the Lord said to Isaiah. So it doesn't say Isaiah, the son of Amos. Why not? There's no real rhyme or reason to this vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw against Babylon. Well, we get that he's the son of Amos. He doesn't have to keep telling us that. If the scribes are very pedantic, or whatever the word is for that. The Lord spoke to Isaiah, the son of Amos. Hold on. Again. Then the Lord spoke to Isaiah, son of Amos. Yet up here, and the Lord said to Isaiah. So why does it need to be in some places Isaiah, in other places Isaiah, son of Amos? It doesn't make sense. So the scribes clearly were changing things as they felt and were not consistent always in how they changed it see when the lord as the, when it's quoting what the lord says when what god says it says as my servant isaiah has walked naked it doesn't say as my servant isaiah son of amos it's just isaiah's because no one talked like that no one said isaiah son of amos they refer to the person as their first name and only refer to their last name if it wasn't clear to people, or not their last name, but who they were a son of, if it wasn't clear, or if they were trying to emphasize their familial uh, origin. But otherwise, it's just not a... It doesn't make sense. Now, let's go down here again. Again, as I said, so Isaiah, the son of Amos, the prophet. Then we have, so the servants of King Ezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them. But then down here, and Isaiah, the son of Amos, was sent to Ezekiah. Why doesn't it just say, and Isaiah was sent to Ezekiah? Again, the son of Amos, irrelevant, not needed. But the scribes were inconsistent there. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet. So we see a bunch of Isaiahs here. It seems to me that a lot of these Isaiah references are secondary and not originally part of the text. And what there's a really good defense of that because scholars notice that there are clear distinctions at the end of Isaiah, the second, the, the final portion of Isaiah, all the way from chapter 40 to the end, is considered a different, such a different book that a lot of scholars have concluded that it was written by a different author. They call it Trito Isaiah. They call it. So we see. 
utero Isaiah. And the trito Isaiah. See, they, they've got these Isaiahs as words not spoken by Isaiah, but some other author. In reality, it's the reverse. These are the original words of Isaiah, which have not been corrupted by insertions of Isaiah's name. And the first section has been altered significantly with Isaiah's name added all throughout in it. So the original version had it so that Isaiah is basically nowhere in the section, all the way from chapters 40 to 66, no mention of Isaiah. Also something to keep in mind, something to keep in mind is, uh, These chapters, well, which chapters is it? 37, I think, or maybe 36, 36, yeah, 36 to 39, correspond to a passage in Book of Kings. So if we were to compare a passage from Kings and Isaiah, we could kind of see, okay, let's determine where this came from, because maybe this passage was not originally in book of Isaiah, maybe it was added into Isaiah from the book of Kings, or maybe the original was very different, but that scribes altered it to make it correspond more closely with the version of the Kings account of this section. So those are some things we have to consider when we're looking into that. Okay, but there's a lot more it gets much deeper than that, but we're going to leave it at that. So that's the book of Isaiah. Now we're going to go over to the book of Jeremiah. Okay, now Jeremiah is an interesting one because the Septuagint and Masoretic differ significantly. But now, just take a look at the word of, well, let's say, came to. I guess we got the word of God which came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to him. Word Lord came to me, came to me, came to Jer the word that came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me. The word that came from the Lord to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, the word that came to Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah, again to Jeremiah, and came to Jeremiah, came to me. Word of the Lord that came to me, came to Jeremiah. Came to Jeremiah, came to Jeremiah, came to me, came to me. In the fourth year of Joachim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word of the Lord came to me. Um, word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So you see, it's very confusing because it differs first person and third person. Sometimes it's Isaiah talking, other times it's about, someone's talking about Isaiah. And notice it introduces this, but it never introduces Jeremiah. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him and I said, well, hold on, Word of the Lord came to him, it should have said, and Jeremiah said, but no, it says, and I said. That's a clear, nonsensical transition. Okay, so um, let's take a look. Take a look at Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, let's see. Um, 
And the word of the Lord came to me saying, okay, that Masoretic text compared to verse four, the word of the Lord came to him. Already. See, there's a difference there. Masoretic has came to me. So the Masoretic appears to be more accurate in this instance because of the contradiction there. Um, let's see verse 13 here. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing there. So it starts off, the Masoretic text, it starts off with, with first person. And the Septuagint it mostly has third person as well. Now we go to chapter 2. And he said, thus saith the Lord. And so let's go to chapter 2. Over the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And he said, thus saith the Lord. So here we have an example where the Masoretic text actually is more faithful to the first person. Whereas the Septuagint is not. Okay, now, let's see here. Uh, we go to chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 11. Yeah, so now it's came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Um, Okay. There's another section I want to look at. Something like 45. Let's see here if I can find it. Uh, Jeremiah. All right. Um, word came to Jeremiah. There's another passage somewhere here where the transition between third person and first person is very awkward. But I don't remember exactly where it is. Um... Let me see if I can quickly find it. If not, we'll move on. Okay. Maybe it's around here. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, um, So I took the purchase deed. I charged Baruch. When I had delivered... transitions to Jeremiah, third person. Um, let's see. Um, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of saying, Go to the house of the Rechabites. Then I, so it sounds like Jeremiah is talking here again. Um, I thought there was another place, but. It might not be. Okay. Uh, 
All right, looks like I don't know where it is, but anyway, so that's Jeremiah. You can see the clear instances of changes there. Let me go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, amazingly, has it in this and this, only in two verses, and that's it. And let's see if it's the same for the Masoretic text. It's going to have, okay, yeah, the rest is footnotes. So, yeah. So, only two places in the book of Ezekiel where it mentions Ezekiel's name. And it's in the very beginning and in the passage where God is speaking about Isaiah, actually about Ezekiel. Now we go to the beginning and we look and the passage which refers to Ezekiel in the third person is very contrary to the context because it's very repetitive and it doesn't really make much. You see it says, and it, now it came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month on the fifth day of the month that I was in the midst of the captivity by the river of Hebar. The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, this was the fifth year of the captivity of King Joachim, and the word of the Lord came to Jezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river of Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. What? The hand of the Lord was upon me? That doesn't make sense. We look at the Masoretic text. And it says, and the Lord was upon him there. Ezekiel has upon me. But so we've got examples here of changes. Um, but it doesn't make sense that this passage, it starts off with Ezekiel talking. And then some scribe was like, oh, we got to tell people who it's referring to. So it's a parenthetical. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest the son of Buzi, in the land of Chaldeans, by the river of Kabar. That's the parentheses that was added by scribes, not part of the original text, because if it was part of the original text, it would have been at the beginning, it would have introduced it, and then Ezekiel would have been speaking. The fact that it's introduced in the middle of a thought shows it's secondary and not part of the original text. So that's pretty much all there is for Ezekiel, but we can have a good idea of the original content of Isaiah and Jeremiah with barely any mention of, Eze of Ezekiel's name throughout the entire book. The same would have been in the case of Isaiah and Jeremiah, but it has been changed in the Isaiah and Jeremiah books. Now we've got the, to Daniel, and Daniel's been altered in many ways as well. It starts off in the first half section completely third person, Daniel, all throughout, just Daniel, about Daniel. Daniel did this, Daniel said this. But then, there's a change. Chapter 7 starts, I, Daniel, beheld. It's from me, Daniel, in the third year of the reign of King Balthazar, a vision appeared to me to me, Daniel. It came to pass as I, I, Daniel. And right here, I was in Susa the palace. I was on the bank of Ubal. So a bunch of eyes here. And we got in the first year of Darius. I, Daniel, understood. And I set my face. Third year of Cyrus, king of the Persians. A thing was revealed to Daniel, now it's third person, whose name was called Balthazar. The thing was true, and great power and understanding in the vision was given to him. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Again, there's not much of a transition here. And I, in the first year of Cyrus, stood to strengthen and confirm. 
I nanual. So you see the, the, these instances indicate that the sections of Daniel may are have been altered. And not, this is pretty evident that there's sections called the additions to Daniel which were added and not originally part of the book of Daniel. The history of Susanna, for instance. Originally it was a part of the book of Habakkuk, an apocrypha book of Habakkuk. Same thing with Bell and the Dragon. So it very well may have been that the beginning section was not originally part of the book of Daniel as well, or if it was, then the original was probably in first person and it was changed. Those are both valid possibilities. But clearly the current text as we have it has been altered. Because it would it doesn't make sense. You've got year, okay. Um, Daniel continued to the first year of King Cyrus. Uh, See, in the first year of Balthazar, Daniel had a dream. In the third year of King Balthazar, a vision appeared to me. Why doesn't it say up here? The first year of Balthazar, I had a dream. Probably because it, either the original didn't say that exactly, and the scribes added the whole sentence, or uh, it was originally in the first person. Um, so those are, because it wouldn't make sense for it to be two different ways of saying it. It's either the first year of Daniel, in the first year Daniel did this, and in the third year Daniel did this, or in the first year I, in the third year I or me. It has to be one both in uh, in each section. It can't be different. A difference indicates a corruption in the text. We've got the same thing with uh, the book of Hosea. So you've got Hosea, the word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go and take thyself away from fornication. So he went and took Gomer or him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Israel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And he said to him, call her name unpitied. And she weaned unpitied, unpitied and she conceived again and bore a son. And he said, call his name not my people. Okay, so we've got all of that. And then there's a prophecy given by God to Hosea. Then, in chapter 3, And the Lord said to me, And love a woman that loves evil things. So I hired to myself for fifteen pieces of silver, and a homer of barley, and a flagon of wine. And I said unto her, So as you can see, up here, it's Lord said to Hosea, so he went and took Gomer, but now down here, it's the Lord said to me, and I went. So a clear difference in how it's worded. Corruption has been done in this book. Amos, we go to Amos now. Lord, let's see. Let's say, let's see. Came to on um, word of the word is it? Oh, Amos. We're gonna look at Amos. Okay. Starts off words of Amos, and go all the way down to here. Thus has the Lord God showed me. I said, and thus the Lord showed me. 
And the Lord said to me, What seest thou, Amos? And I said, An adamant. And the Lord said to me, Then Amaziah the priest sent to Jeroboam, saying, Amos is forming conspiracies. For thus says Amos, And Amaziah said to Amos, Go seer. And Amos answered and said to Amaziah, Thus has the Lord showed me, and behold, a fowler's basket. And he said, What seest thou, Amos? And I said, A fowler's basket. And the Lord said to me, I saw the Lord. So you see, Amos answered and said, and he said, what see is that? So it's, it doesn't make sense. You've got, and Amos answered and said to Amaziah, Amos said to Amos, Amos, excuse me, Amaziah said to Amos, Amos answered and said to Amaziah, but then it changes, and now it's, and he said, and I said, and the Lord said to me. So a clear contradiction in, in the consistency here. Something's wrong. Go to Zechariah now. Let's see what we've got in the Zechariah. Okay, Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah. Okay. Eighth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah. So that's in the, on the 24th, so in the 11th month, in the second year of Darius. Okay. And we've got, came to pass in the fourth year of Darius, the king, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month. Down here, and the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, but now let's say, came to me. Oh, wait a second. Chapter four, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, chapter six, and the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me in chapter seven. And chapter eight. Um, let's see here. The angel that spoke with me said to me, "Cry out!" Uh, so we've got here a narrative being done by Zechariah, and the Lord showed me. Joshua, the high priest. Okay. And the angel that talked with me returned and awakened me. And he said to me, the word of the Lord came to me. And I answered and said to him, and I turned and lifted up my eyes. And the angel that talked with me went forth and said to me, and I turned and lifted up my eyes. And he cried out and spoke to me, saying, Behold, these go out to the land of the north, and they have quieted my anger in the land of the north. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and It came to pass in the fourth year of Darius that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, but Then it says, And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, It's it's interrupting. So, some clear contradiction of consistency of the style. We go to Ecclesiastes. Preacher. So, David. Vanity of vanity, said the preacher. Someone's quoting the preacher. Or someone's clarifying that it was the preacher talking. Because it wouldn't make sense for the preacher to say of himself said the preacher because down here it says i the preacher was king over israel why does it say i say the preacher was king over israel in jerusalem there's no difference it's clear that when someone says said the preacher it's someone else talking about him whereas down here i the preacher he's talking about himself so someone else wrote this Someone else wrote this. And we go down all the way. 
said the preacher. Behold, this I have found, said the preacher, by one at a time to find out the account which my soul sought after, but I found not. For I have not found one man of a thousand, but a woman in all of these I have not found. So why did someone say, said the preacher? Because they wanted people to understand, just so you know, this is not necessarily a true statement, but it's what the preacher said, not what God said. The preacher is the one who said it. Because he says, I have not found one of a thousand. That might imply to some people that there are. I have found one man out of a thousand, and but a woman I have not found. So that might imply that women are evil, they're, they're, that they can't. No righteous woman can be found, and that for men only one man out of a thousand can be found. You could apply that, but that's not always true. So the scribes was like, okay, that's not always true. So we got to make sure people know that it's the preacher that's saying that. That's why at the beginning, vanity of vanities, said the preacher. When it just told you it's the words of the preacher. The words of the preacher, vanity of vanities. They could have said they didn't need this because it was already told us right here, the words of the preacher. But they say vanity of vanities, said the preacher, because they want you to know it's the preacher. They're emphasizing that it's the preacher who's saying it's vanity of vanities. And because the truth is, not everything is vanity of vanities. And at the very end, we're going to see the same thing that's going on here. Vanity of vanity said the preacher all is vanity. And because the preacher was wise above others, so it was that he taught man excellent knowledge. And the ear will trace out the parables. The preacher sought diligently to find out acceptable words in a correct writing, words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails firmly fastened, which have been given one from one shepherd by agreement. And moreover, my son, guard thyself by means of them. In the books there is no end, and much study is weariness of the flesh. Here the end of the matter. The, the sum, someone mistyped this when they did this transcription. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole man. For God will bring every work into judgment, with everything that has been overlooked, whether good or whether evil. This entire thing is certainly not part of the original text of Ecclesiastes. Someone added it to praise the, the writer of Ecclesiastes as wise. It contradicts the style. It's third person, whereas the rest of this was first person. Clearly, someone else wrote this. We got in Tobit, an interesting example, where you have Tobit speaking in the first person. Book of the Words of Tobit. I, Tobit, I, 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 all the way down through chapter 4, chapter 5, uh, no, let's see, that's not chapter, it's, actually it's the first three chapters, at the end of chapter 3, it changes from first person to third person. We also have evidence of many manuscripts of the Book of Tobit have been significantly shortened from the longer version, and in the shorter versions, the first person was changed to the third person. So we have clear evidence of those changes being made. This so what happens with the Book of Tobit as well. Um, there's no transition, just all of a sudden, Tobit's talking the whole time, for the first beginning section. And then after they pray, it switches over to Tobit, uh, being referred to in the third person. Now we go to Ezra. This is interesting, because now we've got interesting phenomena here. After these things came up Ezra. So it's talking about talking about Ezra's here. This is the copy of the order which Arthasasta gave to Ezra's. Whatever Ezra's the priest and scribe of the God of heaven may ask you, it shall be done speedily. Speedily. And thou, Ezra, as the wisdom of God is in thy hand, appoint scribes and judges.
Okay. And then it says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put it, it thus into the heart of the king to glorify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and has given me favor in the eyes of the king, and of his counsel, strengthen according to the good hand of God upon me. And I gather chief men of Israel to go up with me. And these are the heads of their families, the leaders that went up with me. And I proclaimed they were fast. And I gave charge. The princes drew near to me. I rose up from my humiliation. Then I trembled. I bowed, and I bowed myself on my knees. And I said, So, so when Ezra prayed, see, it was first person of Ezra for this. No introduction to Ezra talking, no introduction of Ezra speaking. And then it just gets changed back to third person randomly. No rhyme or reason. And we've got the same thing going on here. Nehemiah. Starts off with first person. I said, uh, and then it goes into chapter seven. And part of the heads of the famous came to the treasury to Nehemiah for the work, a thousand pieces of gold. And Nehemiah and Ezra, the priest and scribe and the Levites, spoke and said. And Ezra said, let's see here. And over them that sealed were Nehemiah. And then it goes and switches back to first person, bizarrely enough. And then again. And in all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, Gave the portions of the singers and the porters a daily rate. And that day they read in the book of Moses. And all this I was not in Jerusalem. So you've got third person switching to first person. Nehemiah talking about Nehemiah, then Nehemiah talking himself. It's all over the place, it's very unreliable. Got, let's look at Enoch. This is one of the best examples. You got uh, oops. Uh, so all throughout Enoch is supposed to be talking, and he does most of the time, first person. But then all of a sudden, before these things, Enoch was hidden, and no one of the children of men knew where he was hidden, where he abode, and what had become of him. His activities had to do with watchers, and his days were with the holy ones. And I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of Majesty. It just comes out of nowhere. It doesn't say, and Enoch said. So it's again, a parenthetical added, not part of the original. The watchers called me, Enoch the scribe, and said to me, Enoch thou scribe. And Enoch went and said, then I went and spoke to all. So you see, it's just going back and forth. So now it's consistently first person. He answered and said to me, I heard his voice. I, Enoch. So it goes like that consistently. Then you got the second vision, which he saw, the vision of wisdom, which Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam saw. Clearly, Enoch did not write that. Then this one, chapter 39. And it shall come to pass in those days that elect and holy children will descend from the high heaven and their seed will become one of the children of men. And in those days Enoch received books of zeal and wrath and books of disquiet and expulsion. And mercy shall not be accorded to them, saith the Lord of Spirits. And in those days everyone carried me off from the earth. What? Why is it referring to Enoch in the third person and then directly after first person and no introduction, no transition? So clearly something's wrong. There's a corruption there. 
Let's go down further. I'm going to see some more corruptions. All of a sudden, in the year 500, seventh month on the 14th day of the month in the life of Enoch. So this is the 500th year of Enoch's life. Um, So clearly it was added by scribe. Now, in those days, Noah saw that the earth it had sunken down and its destruction was nigh. And he arose from thence and went to the ends of the earth and cried aloud to his grandfather Enoch. And Noah said three times with an embittered voice, hear me, hear me hear me and i said unto him tell me what it is that is falling out on the earth that the earth is in such evil plight and shaken lest perchance i sh i shall perish with it and thereupon there was a great commotion on the earth and a voice was heard from heaven and i fell on my face and enoch my grandfather came and stood by me and said unto me after that my grandfather enoch took hold of me now hold, so hold on a second We've got, and he arose from thence and went to the ends of the earth and, and cried aloud to his grandfather e Enoch. And Noah said to him three times with an embittered voice, Hear me, hear me, hear me. Well, I didn't say, and Noah said three times with an embittered voice, Hear me, hear me, hear me. And Noah said unto him, Tell me what it is. So you see, it's contradicting itself. So someone else wrote this. It was not Enoch, it was not Noah. But all this is just Noah talking. For some reason, we've got a passage of Enoch, and then out of nowhere, Noah starts talking. So something's wrong here. A change has happened in the text. We've got the passages from Enoch, first person, passages from Noah, first person, and then third person intervening. That's neither Enoch or Noah. Someone added it. This is the third parable of Enoch, clearly added by scrap. It's not part of the original text. Okay. Um, and after this, I saw another dream, and I will show the whole dream to thee, my son. And Enoch lifted up his voice and spake to his son Methuselah. See, to thee, my son, I will uh, speak, hear my words, incline mine ear to the dream vision of thy father. Why does it make sense? This was sufficient. You didn't need to say an Enoch. So, scribes inserting that again. Okay, let's see here. The book written by Enoch. Enoch indeed wrote this complete doctrine of wisdom, which is praise of all men and a judge of all the earth for all my children who shall dwell on the earth. So this sounds like a corruption, once again, by the scribes. And after that, Enoch both gave and began to account, account from the books. Again, it seems like it's added by scribes. Enoch began to account from the books. Well, it just said that before. Why is it saying it again? See? There's a lot of things about this that really make no sense whatsoever. So we see that the scribes have corrupted these books. Another book which Enoch wrote for his son Methuselah. Okay, so unfortunately, most pretty much every book of the Bible has been corrupted to varying degrees. And the prophets have been corrupted, especially in that the first person has been altered into third person in many places. And there's just been a whole tampering of stuff that's going on. Now, am I saying that the scriptures are not re reliable, they're not trustworthy, and that we can't use them as an authority? Of course not. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we can't blindly use the scriptures and that there are so many corruptions to such an extent that we can't 
just assume that because the Bible says it, it is definitely true, uh, or that it definitely is the word that was originally part of the scripture. We have to be critical, textual criticism. We have to use that and correct the Bible. We have to fix the errors in the Bible. There are lots of errors, but you know, minor errors and lesser errors are not as big of a deal as major errors and extremely significant errors. There are their fair share of major errors, but they're much fewer major errors than minor errors. Um, but we need to treat the books of the Bible like any regular books of literature, history books. History books can be full of truth, but it doesn't mean everything in them is correct because over time, scribes mess it up, copyists mess it up. Just as we use a book of history, we don't throw out a book of history just because it has errors in it. We don't say it's unreliable, it's worthless, can't be trusted because it has some falsehoods in it. We have to discern the nature of how the falsehoods came to be and how bad the falsehoods are. So long as the main overarching point is preserved in the text, as long as you don't take the text too, like, fanatically, as long as you don't take the text too fanatically, in a literal sense of, oh, this has to be the original word, as long as you don't, don't go to that extreme, you'll do very well of using the, the scriptures properly. You won't be led astray when you have the understanding that the scriptures are reliable and authoritative, but only to a certain point, in that they don't override logic, they don't override evidence, fact, science, uh, philosophy, a lot of things they don't override. So we have to take the scripture, combine it with logic and reason, morph it together, combine it with study of science and history, and then we be, we develop the truth. We've discovered the truth. If we seek it with an open mind, without bias as much as possible, can we eliminate all bias completely? No, but we can do a great job of eliminating bias as much as possible. That's what our goal is. That's what my goal is. This project of mine is very significant because we know for a fact the Bible is full of errors. My job as a scribe is to restore the scriptures for you guys. This is a difficult task and it has a lot of responsibility, so much so that we see that it has plenty to say to the scribes. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So, to apply this to me, I'm a scribe, and my job is to bring you guys the scriptures. Follow what the scriptures say. Don't follow what I do, because I may not be in perfect harmony with the scriptures. But as long as I'm giving you guys the scriptures, you follow what the scriptures say. The Pharisees, if they sit in Moses' seat, that means they're in the authority of the government. It's not saying we are to follow the rabbis, but whoever is our government authority, we are to follow their authority within reason. In other words, he's telling us to render unto Caesar what is Caesar. And in a sense, the Pharisees are Caesar. They are just as corrupt as Caesar. But just as we render unto Caesar what is Caesar, we are to render to the Pharisees what is the Pharisees. We are to render to the United States government what is the United States government. So the Pharisee government, we render to them what belongs to them. Their authority, we submit to their authority in the things that they have the right to oversee us in, in government. In the ancient Israel, the Pharisees had that authority over the Israelites because they were the ones sitting in power politically of Israel at the time. The Pharisees are not in authority over every nation, and they're not in authority today in the land of Israel. So we don't have to submit to the Pharisee authority. We have to take that in context. The seat of Moses is the government of Israel. The legal 
authoritative body of the government of Israel, not the religious. They tell you what the religion is, and you have to believe whatever they tell you, and you have to do whatever they tell you. No. They tell you the government, the laws of their government, their nation, and those living in that nation have to abide by those laws, just as Americans have to abide by the American government laws, just as Europe has to abide by the European laws. You know, that's how it goes. So, all throughout the New Testament, chief priests and scribes, the righteousness must exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, he taught them as having as one having authority and not as the scribes. What does that mean? A prophet has authority because they have direct communication from God. Scribes so easily twist what God's word is, they corrupt God's word. When I'm going to try to restore God's word, I'm not going to do a perfect job of it. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to add things that are not part of the original text. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. The work of a scribe will inevitably lead to corruption, unfortunately. Especially because we are dealing with a corrupt text. The only way to fix the corrupt text is to try to alter it, to fix it. But when you do that, it introduces new corruptions, potentially. So you see, Messiah taught as one having true authority, not making guesses, not trying to fix things by their speculation, as a scribe would do, which is what I will do. But he had true prophecy. A scribe does not have prophecy. I do not have prophecy. So in that sense, I do not have that authority. That means it needs to be made clear. But the project is important because I believe I have enough uh, education and understanding of the scriptures to restore very closely to the original text within reason in that clearly I'm not going to restore the original wording all throughout everywhere. There's just no way it's possible because I don't have prophecy, but I can restore the general gist of the original to a point much more accurate than our copies have. And that's sufficient. That should be sufficient for us. We should try to get as close as possible. And that's what my goal is for my Bible product. Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of harsh words for the scribes because they are entrusted with the scriptures. And if they change what the scriptures say to something false, they'll lead people astray. So I have a huge burden and responsibility to not lead people astray with my version of the Bible. I had to stop being a hypocrite in my life. I had to stop being sinful. Um, here we've got here. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. So the Messiah is saying he sends scribes. So Messiah may be indeed sending me as a scribe. He may be sending me as a wise man. I am not a prophet, though. But I could be sent from God as a scribe. But you have to distinguish between scribes and prophets. They're not the same. Scribes can be prophets, but not all prophets are scribes. Not all scribes are prophets. And I'm definitely not a prophet at this time. So... That's pretty much uh, I've got to say here. We do know in the Clementine writings of uh, Peter tells us that not all Pharisees are evil and damned, but the majority of them are. But some of them were not. It goes the same for the scribes. So not all scribes are evil. Some were sent by God. But so now, with that said, I'm going to and this teaching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm sorry I was speaking very low, but I'm trying not to disturb anyone here who's trying to sleep, mainly my dad. So anyways, God bless you guys. I look forward to much more that to come in the future from this project. Uh, and you guys are going to be amazed at what's to come. There's a lot of amazing things that I have the ability to reconstruct and restore using the resources at our disposal. It's a really powerful stuff. I have a clear vision that's been given to me, and I know 
the way I'm supposed to go. I know the general outline of the original text of the Bible, and that's going to come. It's going to be really exciting. So stay tuned, guys. Shalom. God bless you guys. Peace. Bye.